So now that we've covered the half of a component that's associated with the uh, menstrual cycle within the female reproductive system, we're now going to look at the other component, the other half of the female reproductive system and the menstrual cycle that governs it, that would be the uterine cycle. And that's what we'll entitle the next flowchart, uterine cycle. So here we're going to be looking at the specific phases associated with this, but Right now, what we're going to actually do is start at the second sort of phase. We're not going to actually begin at the menstrual phase, the days one through five. We're actually going to start at the proliferative phase for a very specific reason, as we'll see when we round out this video. So we're going to start at the proliferative phase of this part of the uh, menstrual cycle as a whole. So remember, don't treat these two cycles, the uterine and ovarian, as separate entities. They are actually occurring simultaneously, and they actually talk to one another through hormonal interactions, as we'll see, and hopefully we can prove through the next couple of uh, points that we'll make. So the proliferative phase, this is from 6 through 13. So this lines up and matches with and goes uh, in, in a concord with um, the follicular phase. Okay, so proliferative phase, here we go. Over here, this is going to be considered a uh, coordinated event, like we've been saying, and we can write it down as coordinated with the follicular phase, which went from days 1 through 13 of what? Of the ovarian cycle. So separate cycle, but still, again, think of them as occurring simultaneously. They do occur simultaneously. So 6 through 13 overlaps with 1 through 13. So we have this coordination at that phase. So what happens here? What's the purpose of this part of the uterine cycle? So here what we notice are ovarian hormones stimulating the uterus. So ovarian hormones, hormones that come as a result of the ovarian cycle. So these ovarian hormones from days 1 through 13 of the ovarian cycle actually stimulate the uterus. This is the uterine cycle, so it's going to be focusing a lot on the uterus. So these hormones stimulate the uterus. How do they stimulate it? What does this cause? This is actually cause a preparation to begin. The uterus then is going to prepare for a possible implantation, so a possible embryonic implantation that may occur if fertilization occurs. So you have to prepare. There's a lot of work associated with preparing for a possible implantation. So you have to do um, the following scenario. So once this preparation sort of signal has happened, this is going to be governed by a hormone, and that's going to be estradiol. And the estradiol doesn't just come from anywhere, it comes from the follicular cells. And how do the follicular cells, which are a part of the ovarian cycle, get this estradiol being released from them? Well, they got the message from FSH and LH, and that caused them to start secreting estradiol, and estradiol will not only work on the ovarian side, but will also have an influence on the uterine side, specifically at the proliferative phase, by having the estradiol at this proliferative phase, we're then going to have a preparation for the embryo. What is the preparation? The preparation is, of course, the endometrium, that interior part of the uh, uterus of the womb will thicken. So the endometrium thickens. Remember how we said that this happens? We didn't really explain how. This is how. Estradiol is what causes this to happen. How does estradiol come? It comes from the follicular cells. How does follicular cells make estradiol? Well, that's because they're part of the ovarian cycle, etc. So that's our proliferative phase from days 6 through 13. After days 6 through 13, what's next? It's always day 14. What's that day 14? That very important event of ovulation. So there's always going to be very important sort of post and pre ovulation scenarios. This is a pre-ovulation event and phase. Now we're going to look at some post-ovulation events and phases. So remember, ovulation overlaps with the uterine cycle and the ovarian cycle, both of which have this event occur simultaneously. So what's next? Next would be something known as the secretory phase. So this is the next phase of the uterine cycle. This is from, from days 15 to 28. Again, we have a perfect alignment actually here. So this secretory phase is coordinated. That means it's not separated or independent of, but it's actually working with and uh, in line with the luteal phase. And the luteal phase was also specifically from days 15 to 28 of the ovarian cycle. 
So again, don't think of these as separate entities. These two cycles, they talk to one another. And let's see how, so the, we saw the talking here. Now well, let's look at the talking, the interaction between the two cycles in the secretory phase. Here what we notice is that because the luteal phase is occurring, a corpus luteum is, uh, is going to be producing stuff. So the CL from the ovarian cycle is producing lots of progesterone, produces lots of progesterone, P-R-O-G for progesterone, and also the estradiol hormone, E-S-T-R-A for estradiol. So we have these two hormones being produced by the corpus luteum because the luteal phase is, in, uh, is happening. What does this cause for the uterus, for the uterine cycle? What does this do for the uterine cycle? Well, this actually causes the further development, even more development, even more preparation for the uh, endometrium of the endometrium. So the endometrium initially we saw was thickening in the proliferative phase. Now it's developing even more. It's more specifically, we can state that its arteries are getting enlarged. So the enlargement uh, of the endometrium arteries What's the purpose of this? The purpose of this is increased blood flow. More blood flow means more nutrients. More nutrients for who? More nutrients for, of course, the possible implanted embryo. The possible implanted zygote needs tons and tons of nutrients. Tons and tons of nutrients are going to be delivered via blood flow, and blood flow can only happen via uh, vascularization. Arteries are going to be forming. In addition, the endometrium will also undergo gland growth. The endometrium, remember, the uterus is also going to have gland capabilities, meaning that it will also secrete certain hormones. It will secrete things, let's say, not even just hormones. And the, and the uterus will actually, because of the gland growth, as a result of progesterone and stradiol levels being high from the corpus luteum, the glands are going to grow at the endometrium within the uh, uterus. And this is then going to secrete nutrient fluid. Again, why are we secreting this? Because there might possibly be a little uh, zygote that needs to develop and it needs nutrients and that's going to be secreted by the uh, developing endometrium. So it secretes nutrient fluid and we'll say to support a possible, let's say, uh, early embryo. To support early embryo um, before any sort of uterine implantation. So it's basically, again, another prep stage, just in case we have an implantation at the uterus, we need to have support for a possible zygote that may be implanted here, a possible uh, early fetus that may be planted here. So what do we do? We make sure that there's a nutrient fluid there for it to utilize. We make sure that there are arteries there for it to get blood flow and oxygen and everything necessary for its eventual development. So we invest a lot of time in preparation for this, a lot. But guess what? Most of the time, this is not for pregnancy. It doesn't happen, essentially. So there's mostly going to be no pregnancy in the female life cycle, only at certain points. So what we notice is then the consequences of this. The corpus luteum disintegrates, as we saw before, because the LH and FSH levels are getting too low. The corpus luteum cannot survive. It's only temporary as an endocrine gland, and this is the temporary nature. This is then going to cause, because the corpus luteum is gone, it can't make lots of progesterone and estradiol. So then this will cause a sharp decrease in both progesterone and estradiol. So if we have a sharp decrease in those two hormones, this is going to cause a direct sort of end to the development. How so? The endometrium will no longer develop because its arteries that have been enlarging actually constrict. Those arteries constrict because they don't have any more messages from progesterone and estradiol to continue their growth. They are then going to be basically deprived of blood. The body says, you no longer need blood because there is no pregnancy. So we're going to deprive you of blood, thus the constriction. This would mean that there's no circulation whatsoever to this thickening or once thickened endometrium. What's this going to be as a so sort of a total consequence of this? Basically, the body will say, okay, so no pregnancy, guess we have to forget about this uh, thickening and preparation that we did. The lining, that thick lining that we were making, it disintegrates. It is sloughed off, essentially.
it's all going to go away. All of the gland growth, the arteries, uh, everything that we prepared for goes away because there is no pregnancy and thus it's not necessary. And why does it go away? When does it go away? It goes away at the menstrual phase. But hey, you might be thinking, how can we go to a next phase? This is from 15 to 28. That's the end of it. Well, guess what? The technically beginning of the uterine cycle is the menstrual phase, the actual point at which this is happening from days one through five. So this actually lines up with the follicular phase as well. So here, the menstrual phase, very simply speaking, we have that endometrial tissue, that thickened tissue. It no longer is necessary because there is no pregnancy, thus we will undergo menstruation. So the tissue, the fluid that was there, the nutrient fluid that we made, and also uh, blood as a whole, this, these are all going to be shed. They're going to be gone, and uh, they're going to go away. They're going to be released, disintegrated, sloughed off, and then you're going to have new follicles. Will so a, a totally new follicle, a set of follicles. Remember those six to twelve follicles will begin growth. So we start the cycle all over again. After, of course, we've released the endometrium that's thickened in the previous cycle. So essentially, what you want to remember about the menstrual phase is that this is a confusing point for many students, but it's very simple. Day one of the menstrual flow within females, when this begins, some people think this is the end of the cycle. Technically, any point because of the cycle can be the beginning or the end, but day one of the menstrual flow is considered also going to be uh, simultaneously day one of new uterine and ovarian cycles. Why is that? Well, that's because this day one of menstrual flow aligns perfectly with day one of the follicular phase, thus day one of the ovarian cycle. And it is, of course, day one of the menstrual phase of the uterine cycle, thus a new uterine cycle is signified by the start of menstrual flow. This is basically kind of like the idea that in a cycle, the end is the beginning, and that's basically what we see here. Overall, what you need to understand about the uterine cycle, though it's complex, it's very important for making sure that there is enough preparation happening for a possible pregnancy. Um, also, just a fact to remember, the average woman will undergo about 500 cycles, 500 uterine cycles, and uh, therefore 500 ovarian cycles in their lifetime. This equates to about 38 years of their life will be devoted to making and doing these cycles over and over and over again in hopes of a possible pregnancy.